So chapter four, decisions. Now, I bet you've already taken another programming language. I bet you already know what an if statement is. Probably know what an if else is. You may even know what a switch is. So, do we have to do this chapter? Yeah, I guess we better do it. But the uh, in-class tutorial that I'd prepared actually went for chapter five, which was looping. And looping is a more interesting concept just because I assume that we all have ifs. Anyways, blazing onward. So an if statement is part of the decision or the branching. Basically, there's four types of flow control. There's sequential, there's branching, there's looping, and then there's function calls or method calls where it jumps out to do something else, it executes that code, and then it comes back. So decisions. Is the expressway backed up? If that's true, then do something. Go to golf road, turn left, turn right, whatever. You get the idea. And then if this isn't true, you do something else. You have money. If you have money, drive to McDonald's, buy food, eat, come home. If you don't have money, Stay home, cook ramen noodles, eat, throw ramen noodle away. So the decision structure involves choosing between alternative courses of action based on some value within a program. All computer decisions are yes, no, when reduced to their most basic form. So the if statement, <clears throat> used to make a single alternative decision. This is if you don't have if else. So, if the condition is true, something will happen. If not, nothing will happen. And so the way it works is you have an if statement, and then you have either a single line of code or a block of code. The block of code will be in curly braces, or it can be a single line of code, which you could optionally put within curly braces or not. Nothing wrong with just putting curly braces everywhere, always, all the time. That's kind of my preference, unless I'm trying to type in as much code on the screen for a video. As possible. So the if expression that precedes the block is the control statement for the decision structure. Now their flow charts look a little bit different than how I teach them. I always put the actual word if in my decision blocks because you could have other form of decision blocks too. You could have whiles for example. But if number is less than five, write A. Then after that write B. So if the number is 0, it'll print A, B. If the number is 10, it'll only print B. There is no else clause in this case. And I used an editor once where every time you typed an if, it went ahead and automatically added the word else, expecting you to, and that was kind of annoying. So this is a syntax error. If number is less than 5, semicolon. Right line A, and then right line B. If you put a semicolon there, it basically says, if number is less than 5, do absolutely nothing. Then write A and then write B. So it looks like this. That's a way to break your code. You put a semicolon after a while statement or an if statement or a for statement. It just means do nothing. And it'll either go into an infinite loop or it just won't do what you want at all. So in this case, a semicolon kills it so that no matter what happens, it does nothing, and then it prints out both A and B. And unlike Python, indention doesn't matter a whit. Just because that code is indented under it doesn't make it part of that if statement. The only thing that makes it part of that if statement is if you leave off the semicolon and put braces around it, or at least only have one statement. Very common bug. When I'm walking around helping people, usually a third of the problems are caused by people putting semicolons after if statements and while statements. So this time, we've put two statements inside the if. If you have more than one statement, it's a block of code, and you absolutely have to have the curly braces. You may think that you can get away without putting the curly braces there. But like I said, just because they're indented doesn't make them part of a block of code. And you can't. Only in Python can you get away with not using the curly braces. In C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Java, I believe JavaScript. I could be wrong about that. I don't think I am. 
you have to have the braces. Just get used to them, and I'd recommend using them even if you only have one line of code. But in that case, it is optional. So a nested if, you can put an if inside of an if. You can put an if inside of a loop. You can put a loop inside of an if. You can put a loop inside of an if inside of a loop inside of an if inside of a loop. Those are all just nested structures. Once you get like more than two nested levels, though, think about breaking that code out into its own procedure because the brain just can't really handle it. If you're looking at the code and trying to understand what it does, if you didn't write it, if somebody else is looking at it, then their eyes are going to cross. If you had like four nested structures, like I just said, it'd be better to have one nested structure that calls a function, and then that function has its own loop in it, something like that. If you put a return statement down inside a bunch of nested structures, it bails out of them all. But if you put a break statement inside a bunch of nested loops, and we're not talking about loops, then it only exits the innermost loop. Creating too many levels can result in code that is difficult to understand and maintain. A computer can understand it, but it's hard for us to understand, so it's hard for us to maintain. Won't you get an error if you try to use a break statement with an if? Right. You can't break out of an if, unfortunately. Maybe. I can't say why I'm saying unfortunately, <laughs> but it seems to me like you ought to be able to use a, a break inside of any block of code and have it skip to the end of the block. Just syntax-wise, I think that would be preferable, but I don't see any languages doing that. So here's our nested if. If the number is greater than low, if the number is less than high, write the number is between the low and the high. And pictorially, if the number is greater than low, do something. If the number is less than high, do something else. Write the number is between low and high. So I don't think we're going to get to my WPF application today. I think we're going to wind up doing something, a console app, based on, uh, you know, ifs and switches and things like that. So here's a little program. Write, enter an integer, read line into a number string, convert it into a number, if that number is greater than a low value and that number is less than a high, if you hear me say that word and and you're already programmed in other languages, you know where this is going next. Then the number is between 1 and 2, so print that out using our placeholder. So it'll say enter an integer 10 and or enter 6, and then it's between 5 and 10, and so it would print 6 is between 5 and 10. We have three placeholders, 0, 1, and 2. We're filling them in with three arguments. So the single equal sign used to copy values from one place to another. Double equal sign compares. Some programming languages let you write this code, but it's not valid code. If x is equal to y, that would be valid. If x single equals y, they, they've written a pretty complicated expression there. So I'm rewriting this to do, be my example. If x equals y, that was supposed to be an if, not an x, that is invalid. Some languages will let you compile that. They may give you a warning. What would it do? It would destroy the value of x. Right? It would copy y into x and then perform the if, the if statement. And if this resulted in 0, it would treat it as false. If it resulted in a non-zero value in those languages, it would treat it as true. C is like that. I believe that this compiler will just flat out refuse to let you do an assignment like that in the middle of an if statement. And to me, that's correct. I cannot say that I ever, in 30 years, ever meant to put an equal sign inside of an if. If I did, it was always a typo. And if it was a language that let you do that, it caused problems. So the single equal is known as the assignment operator. The double equal is the equality comparison operator. So sometimes you want to do something or something else. That's an if-else. 
If the project is under budget, we get a bonus. Else, we don't get a bonus and we write a message saying notify contractor. So that's flow charted as a decision block and the true side has one thing happening and the false side has something else happening. And again, those can be blocks of code. They will probably be blocks of code, so I would put braces around them even though they're not being shown here. If number is greater than high, right line something else, right line something else. Going through this kind of quickly because I'm expecting you to have already taken another programming course. Read the book if you don't understand it. I know we've already used if statements, I believe, in our code, so we've already hit the concept, and it's pretty intuitive. It's the easiest concept in programming. What's the hardest? <laughs> the hardest thing in programming might be passing the addresses of functions to other functions so that they can be stored in an array or so that they can be called back by somebody else's piece of code. Uh -oh. So that's kind of weird. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they get more complicated than that still, but uh, we typically don't even get to that in these programming courses. One of those ideas is called a callback function. Like, if you want to tell Windows to do a certain bit of code, if a certain event happens, you could register a callback function with it so you would pass them the address of the function and then when a problem occurred or whatever that it, whenever that event occurred then it would call your own code and you wouldn't see that call anywhere kind of like the way we see our button click handler but instead you were registering it directly with the operating system and I think the callback functions have gone by the wayside and everything is handled by frameworks now because that was kind of a really nasty way of programming So you can combine multiple decisions into a single if statement. Remember back here we had two if statements in a row. If the number was greater than high, excuse me, greater than low, and the number was less than high. This is what's known as an if cascade. You have an if, and another if, and maybe a third if, and maybe a fourth if, you know, something like this. That was supposed to be notepad. If hungry, if have money, right line, let's go eat, let's go out to eat. If you have an if cascade like that, if you have nested ifs, and that's really all that you have going on in there, the logic isn't more complicated than that, then it would be better to write it as an and. First, I'm going to write the word that you don't use. Like if you were a Python programmer, you would type this, if hungry and have money. Then write line. Let's go out to eat. Can I type, please? But in all the languages that are descended from C, including this one and Java, then uh, you use two ampersands to mean and two ampersands. The and means that both of these have to be true before this happens. But that was the case here, right? If we weren't hungry, then it wouldn't go in to that block. And if we didn't have money, then it wouldn't go into that block. So we were able to combine those into a single statement because logically these are equivalent. Now if you're doing something a little bit more complicated like else, say we were hungry but we don't have any money, stay home and eat ramen. You couldn't represent that really with and, right? Where would we insert this code? So it's not universally true that just because you have nested if statements you can use and. But if the logic is just a pure cascade like that, you can. So tip, basically, if you have A and B, then this resolves to true if both A and B are true. If either A is false or B is false or both of them are false, it resolves to false. So 
you can make a little logic chart where you have A, B, and the result. And I'm going to use zeros for false and ones for trues just because those are easier to read than T's and F's are. Only one of these results will give us a true. And which one is that? Because we're using ands. So, yep, it would be the 1 1. Because both of them are true. The rest of them are not true. So, those would all give us a false. But sometimes you want to do something if only one of those is true, in which case you use or. And so, without that, you could wind up writing something like this if sic right line stay home. If tired, right line, stay home. If weekend, right line, stay home. It's not an if cascade, it's a series of ifs, right? They're not nested. But we have three conditions when we get to stay home. We could chain those together with ors. If sick, or tired, or weekend. I'm going to have to go and replace those words or. Right line, stay home. So or in the C family is two vertical bars, which is the shift backslash, which is the shift of the key above the inner key on your keyboard. Like that. So if I'm sick or I'm tired or it's the weekend, I get to stay home. Must be nice to get to stay home just because I'm tired. two chapters open and they're on different pages. Why did it... Yeah. But I only had one. All of a sudden I'm way back. So the conditional AND operator. Use two ampersands. And I don't know what UST means. And include a complete Boolean expression on either side of the operator. So sometimes people wish they could write this. If x is less than 3 and greater than 1, right? Kind of looks right. In English, it sounds right. If x greater than 3 and less than 1. But the way you have to analyze it is you have to have a Boolean expression on both sides. x greater than 3, yeah, that resolves to true or false. But in isolation, does greater than 1 mean anything? No, it doesn't mean anything at all. So that would have been a syntax error. To fix it, we have to do that. Another thing that people do is if 3 is less than x is, le is greater than 1. I think I've done that wrong. If 1 is less than x, which is less than 3, because that's algebra. People have written, you know, in the past you may have taken a math class where that works. But again, that doesn't work at all. Because this is a binary operator. It's supposed to require a number on either side. And it returns a true or a false. So if it said true greater than 3, no, wouldn't work. So the things on either side of AND and OR have to be complete expressions or a Boolean variable. It's okay to write it like this because that, we're assuming a sick is a Boolean variable. And I'm assuming a tired is a Boolean variable and weakened is a Boolean variable. There. If it wasn't, then you wind up writing things like this. If our temperature in Celsius is less than zero, or the temperature in Celsius is greater than 100, then right line 
not a liquid. Why did I write or there? Because I was thinking Python. There we go. So hopefully you see that the things on either side of the or can either be a Boolean variable, like that, or they can be a numeric, you know, an expression that uh, evaluates to true or false. I was thinking of digressing into old versions of C, and I'm not going to do it. Judicious restraint. So truth tables are diagrams used in math and logic to help describe the truth of an entire expression based on the truth of its parts. And let me guess, they don't really give us an example of that except for, here we go. Here's our truth table for AND. If two things are true, the result is true. Every other case is false. If we flip to another one, then we'll see the truth table for OR. OR means either one side or the other has to be true before the result is true. So if you're sick or you're tired, you get to stay home. The only time you don't get to stay home is if you're not sick and you're not tired. So if you remember our truth table for AND, there was only one case that gave you a true. And that was when both inputs were true. For OR, there's only one case that gives you a false, which is when both inputs are false. So if I was going to write the truth table for OR, in my own fashion with zeros rather than, we would have A or B, and the result, and then we have 0, 0, 0, 1, I should be using a tab key, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so if 1 represents true and 2 represents false, then all we care about is whether one side or the other side or both are true, and then the result would be true. So here both of them are false, so the result's going to be false. But here one side is definitely true, here the other side is definitely true, and here both sides are true, so the result is definitely true. And these are the results, by the way, of binary operators, when you're binary combining two values with another one. And this is a digression, and it's not in this chapter. But if you had this number, 4, now let's do 5, or 7. But this was a binary or. I'm going to call it bore, although that's not the word for it at all. It's actually just a single bar like that. And we wanted to figure out what that was. We would have to convert these to binary to see what was going on. Now a 5 is a 4 and a 1, so it's a 1, 0, 0, 1. And if you don't remember what this is, that's okay. And a 7 is a, I think I got that wrong. It's a 0, 1, 0, 1. And a 7 is a 0, 1, 1, 1. And since we're doing OR, then we compare, and if one or the other one is lit up, then the result is lit up. So just going left to right, or is that zero lit up? And, and I mean, it, out of these two, is either one lit up? No, so the result is false. How about that one and, or that one? Well, both of them are lit up, so that counts. How about that one or that one? Well. One of them's lit up, so that counts. And then that one or that one. So, and then if we converted this back to a decimal number from binary, then we get that 5 or 7 in binary is a 7. And that's not logical, that's numbers. Now, if we did 5 and 7, the result would be different. Again, in binary. I'm going to. Label that as an OR. Label this as an AND. Now both numbers, both
both in the column have to be on for the result to be true. Neither one of them are on here. Neither one of them are true there. Both of them are true here, so that counts. Only one of them is true here, and it was an and, so they both needed to be active. That's off. And then now we have one last column where both of them are true. So the expression here is that 5 and 7 is equal to, and we got 0101, which is 5. Just looking at it, that kind of looks odd, right? 5 or 7 equals 7, 5 and 7 equals 5, but bitwise, that's what it works out. And I could give, I could come up with different examples where the result was not the same as either one of the operands, but I'm not going to bother. Digression. Binary or and binary and. Dealing with zeros and ones. So in class, we're going to do an assignment where we ask what sort of volume they want to calculate, either a block or a sphere. And then we, once we get in there, we're going to ask them for, you know, if it's a block, we need a height, width, and a depth, or an x, y, and z, however you want to think about that. And based on the height, width, and the depth, we can figure out the volume and the area. For a sphere, it's a different equation. 4 thirds times pi r cubed, and the area is that. Now I'm using the exponent operator here. The language doesn't have an exponent operator, so we'll have to use a library function in order to do that. Or we could just do r times r times r. The reason I'm mentioning the exponent operator is because I used it throughout here. And by the way, when I say z 2 to the power of 0.5, that's the same thing as saying the square root of 2. So, here the equation for the area of a tetrahedron, which is a four sided block. If you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons, you may have rolled that, rolled that pyramid die. It had four sides. Here's how you calculate the surface area it's four times. 3, the square root of 3, times the edge length squared. I think I'll just make it edge times edge times edge. Is that easier to read? I don't know. Edge to the power of 3. That's what that means. And so you could replace this with square root of 3, if you felt like it. Note. Something to the 0 0.5 is the same as or x to 0 0.5 is the same as square root of x. So you can do it either way. All right, so we ask them what sort of volume they want to calculate. Then we gather the dimensions. A sphere only has one dimension, the radius. The block has three. And then, based on that stuff, after we do these calculations, we print the volume and the area. So let's do it. So this is going to be the in-class part of it, the block and the sphere. And then we're also going to do a cube and a cylinder as homework. No, a tetrahedron, a cube and a cylinder. I'm leaving you the hard ones. I'm a jerk. Maybe we ought to do the tetrahedron. No, no, no. I'm going to leave you all the hard ones. Got to, got to keep things challenging. So I'm going to create a new app. Rather than make things complicated, we're just going to do a console app. So new project, console application. September 20, or shapes, whatever you want to call it, volume calculator. Remember to do a save as so you don't lose your work. It's really 
weird that if you don't save, then... Okay. So here we go. I'm going to go and grab my comments here and paste them in just so I have a, a structure to follow. So our first comment, X, X, ask the user what sort of volume they want to calculate. So string choice. And how do we get our input once we've used, if it's a console app? Choice is equal to, yeah, system dot console dot read line. But we need to tell them what to do. So system dot out dot no 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 no. <laughs> start to, start to use Java. System dot console dot write line. Perform calculations on, I'm breaking into two lines, A for block. I could do numbers as well, right? But we're getting strings back from here, so why not just use strings? B for sphere. Now, it'd be neat if we could get all of our information before we entered a, a calculate block, but unfortunately, the variables we have to read in differ, you know, based on whether it's a sphere or a block. A block has three dimensions, a sphere is one. So we're going to wind up putting all of that into one big block, most likely, I mean, in, in a big if statement. But I'm going to save, I think, Let's, let's declare a variable, which is going to be called shape, and we're going to fill it with a string, block or sphere. And let's declare a value for the volume, and a, I'm going to initialize all of these. So empty string there, shape is equal to empty string, volume is equal to zero, and area is equal to zero. So I guess I'll put a comment here. We will calculate surface area and volume based on their choice and input. Now I'm going to move those three variable declarations above everything else. Not necessary, but I kind of like seeing my variables listed up at the very top. I'm sure I'm getting a lot of errors here. What are all these? Oh, I had a bunch of extra notes. These all should be comments. So now we need an if. If they choose A, then it's a block. If they choose B, it's a sphere. And if we're going to set the shape and we're going to calculate the area and the choice. Why are we doing all this? So that underneath it, we can do a console right line that looks like this. So once we have our results, print results. This is where I'm working for. Console dot, can I just skip doing the system dot? Yeah, I can. Console dot right line. the area of the placeholder is placeholder and we're going to fill that in with the shape and the area and we're going to write another one console dot write line the volume of the placeholder is placeholder and to that we're going to pass in the shape and the volume. So I hope you see why we did this. This way we are separating our display 
from the input. Like if we were going to write a, a, a Windows form application or a WPF application, we could calculate the area, we could calculate the volume, and then we would set those separately from the calculations. Same kind of idea. Yeah, we could display them as part of the great big if block we are coming up with next. All right, so let's do our big if block. If choice is equal to a lowercase a or an uppercase a, or choice is equal to an uppercase a, then it's a block. So let's set our shape string equal to the word block. We could do it lowercase. And let's do our calculations, but we need to get our input first. So equals isn't like ignore case. It's, it's you have to either have capital B or lowercase, or capital A or lowercase A. Right, right, right. Um, in this case, I don't know of an equals ignore case in this language, unlike Java. And we can find it real fast. C sharp equals ignore case. Probably a way to do it. Comparing two strings. Okay, yeah, there are complicated ways of doing it. I don't want to use the complicated way. Well, a cube is a specialized form of block where all the all three dimensions are the same. Okay, we might be able to use equals ignore case. Let's give this a shot. If choice, but I wanted to have an or in it just to represent, you know, our, uh, our, our but uh, maybe we'll mix it up and we'll check for B you're doing it the other way. And yeah, we could have done like B for block, you know, and S for sphere, and C for cylinder, and T for tetrahedron, and what was our last one? Okay, so since we were going to do both a cube and a cylinder, we would have had two C's. I kind of had a hunch that that was going up, so I'm just going to do A, B, C, D, E. Or we could do one, two, three, four, five. But I wanted to have the nice or there. All right, so if the shape is equal to block, and now we need to get the input, I need a temporary variable for my input. String S is equal to console.readline, but I forgot to tell them what I was reading. So let's write a message out. Eventually, I wind up writing a a function, a method, where you can print it a message and it'll do the conversion. But I'm not going to do that this time. So console dot right line. What is the height? We get that string, and then we need a boolean to check the results. Be okay so that we can do BOK is equal to, I'm really kind of getting tired of IntelliSense popping up. Excuse me, it's just bool, BOK. And then BOK is equal to double dot try parse the string, followed by the word out, followed by our variable, which I haven't defined, h, or height. Let's use the whole word, height. kind of wish I declared all my variables up at the top of my block as normal. I'm going to do that. Sorry, guys. String s. I'm going to make it an empty string just because I love initializing my variables. And then bool be okay. And then I can just do s is equal to console read line. And then BOK okay is equal to double dot tri parse, but I'm getting an error there. Oh, because I don't have my height yet. 
So what are we going to need? We're going to need a double height and a width and a depth. Or you could call them X, Y, Z if you wanted. All right, now you see those three statements, height, width, and depth. I'm going to try to do all three conversions before I print out an error message. And to do that, I'm going to have to use BOK or equals. And I'm not really kind of digging that. So I guess I'm going to do BOK1, BOK2, and BOK3. So BOK1, BOK2, BOK3. This is really why you should compartmentalize your stuff into procedures. Because we're going to be repeating chunks of code. What are you complaining about there? All righty. So BOK1 is equal to double dot try. Why don't we do all the conversions later? Nope, we kind of want to do them as we're going along. So now I'm going to copy and paste this stuff. Why? Because I don't want to type it in three times. So, but the second one is going to be the width. The third one is going to be the depth. So we need to make some careful changes. The second one is going to be what is the width question mark. S is equal to console.readline. And then BOK2 is equal to double dot try parse. You couldn't could do the, I guess, height, height, okay, depth, okay. And... Right, right, right. We could have given these Boolean variables better names. Right. So instead of BOK, it could have been height, okay, and width, okay, and depth, okay. That would have made sense. And if you feel like changing that to be better, that's totally cool. So height, width, and then the last one is depth. So change depth there, make this be OK. 3 is equal to, and then try parse needs our depth variable. Yeah. It usually will let me do that, but now it's making me delete the whole line. I don't know. Yeah, the editor can get kind of funky. All righty, so we, it's funny, the rest of our shapes that we chose, I believe, only have one input variable rather than three. Because, you know, well, the cylinder is going to have two. It's going to have a width and a, uh, excuse me, a radius and a height. But the block requires three, so we're doing the hardest one. I'm really wishing I'd um, taken your suggestion of making them height okay, width okay, and depth okay. So I guess I'm going to do that. I'm going to come up here to BOK1, right click on it, and choose refactor, rename, and call that one height okay. Then I'm going to do the same thing for BOK2. I'm going to right click on it, choose refactor, rename, width OK. Right click on the third one, refactor, rename, depth OK. And apply. OK, so we've gotten all the input. We've gotten whether the data was translated correctly or not. Now we need to do an if to see if our data is valid. So we're going to do if height OK and width OK and depth OK. So we've used or up here, and now we're going to use and underneath. But now would be a good time to run it just to make sure that I don't have any syntax errors yet. Run early, run often. OK, for block or sphere, I've only implemented block. So A, what is the height? 34. What is the width? 45. What is the depth? 35. OK, great. It didn't do anything, of course, but we got all our input. So now let's see if we have an error. If height OK and 2 ampersand, shift 7, 
width OK, and the depth is OK. Then great, we're going to do some calculations, else we're going to print an error message. It'd be neater if we made an error message string, though, and displayed that at the end, right? But I guess we'll just do it here. So console dot right line not all input was numeric. Sorry. Just taking care of that case. Now we can do it. Volume of a shape of a block is the height times the width times the depth. The area of a block is two times height times width plus height times depth plus width times depth. I didn't really need that extra space there, did I? And you can Google that up to confirm it if you want. What we'll do is we'll enter a height, width, and depth of 1 because a 1 by 1 by 1 block has a volume of 1 and a surface area of 6, right, because it's got 6 sides. Right, yeah, you have to do all three sides and then you have to double it. So it's height times width plus height times depth plus width times depth. All right, we actually have a working program at this point. It only does blocks, but it should run and it should even have some error handling in there and it should print out the results. So I'm going to build it and run it again. Rebuild and then start. I'm going to change my properties so that y'all can see this a little bit better. Where's your, oh, did you write your, the area of the blank is, did you write that I put in? Right, I displayed the area of it all down here at the bottom after our if statement. I had a print results section. It. it won't let me change it while I'm running it, but there it is. So going back to my sample run, A for block, B for sphere. So A, what is the height? One, width, one, depth, one. And guess what I did? I forgot to put my thing in there that's going to keep it open. So after everything else, console.read key. And we could write a message out that told them to hit enter to close. So console.write line, hit enter to close at. So I did that at the, at the bottom after our big if statement. Calculation on block A, it's a one by one by one. The area of the block is six. The volume of the block is what? We could be a little bit more specific and say the area is units squared and the volume of the block is units cubed. Did you have to give area a value for it to work? I initialized everything to zero because otherwise I would have gotten a uninitialized variable. So if I went up here and I removed my initialization, I do not think it would compile. Yeah, I would get an error here, and it's complaining about the fact that I'm trying to print it out. So when you declare your variables, make sure that you initialize them if you're going to follow this style. Let me go on and do that change. My shift down just pasted a whole other area. All right, 
So we talked about trying a different method where we didn't have to check for both the uppercase and the lowercase. I'm going to give that a shot down here. So in my else, I'm going to do an else if choice dot equals ignore case. I don't see that choice. They lied. Okay, and then as a parameter you can pass in, that'll specify the case and the sort rules and blah, blah, blah. So forget it. We're not going to use equal ignore case. The best thing to do in that case is just to make the string uppercase before you check, if you only want to have one check rather than two. You can convert the string to uppercase. You can pull out the first letter to make sure that they didn't type in multiple letters, and then you can do this kind of if. So anyways, if the choice is a B, lowercase b, or... So shift bar, shift backslash, excuse me, choice is equal to a uppercase B. Then, something's going on there. Oh, it's a string, so I need to put double quotes around it rather than a single quote. The shape we have is a sphere. This does not require as much information. We do need our Boolean, so bool radius OK. And then we're going to need a string for our input. And we're going to need a double for our radius. And I think that'll be enough. I know you're relaunching the app, so I'll pause it in a minute so you can catch up on the typing. All righty. Same kind of business. Radius OK is equal to double dot try parse. The, whoops. I forgot to ask them for the input before I start trying to parse it. So that line's a waste for now. Console.write line, what is the radius? If you just want the output to be, if you want the input to be on the same line as the output, you could just make it right rather than the right line. And then s is equal to console.readline. Now we can parse it. Radius OK is equal to double dot try parse the string followed by the word out followed by the variable we're trying to read into which is radius and now we need our if statement to see if that was valid data if radius okay we only had one variable to check so we're not going to use an and I guess we could do something like check to see if these are positive values, you know, <laughs> if, they're, if they entered a negative radius, then we could complain, but nah. So if the radius is okay, the area of a sphere is equal to 4 times, how do we get math.pi? Math.pi, and then how do we take something to the second power? Math. POW, uppercase P, the radius to the power of 2. So I think I'll rewrite those equations to actually use square root because we do have square root. Because not every, it doesn't click with everybody that if you take a, something to the power of, of 1 half, it's the same thing as taking the square root. Okay, and then the volume is equal to 4.0 divided by 3.0 times math.pi times math.pow radius to the power of 3, radius cubed. Why did I do 4.0 divided by 3.0 rather than 4 divided by 3? 
If you have two integers dividing, then the result is rounded down. So 4 divided by 3 gets rounded down to 1, rather than being 1.333. Just like 3 divided by 4, you'd like for it to equal 0.75, but if those are just pure integers, rather than floating point numbers, then 3 divided by 4 gets rounded down to 0, which is certainly not what you want. All righty. That seemed like a lot less typing than the block. It was because we only had three. We only had one dimension to acquire rather than three. I'm going to run it, then I'll bring the code back up. So B for a sphere. I'm going to type in garbage. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I handled the garbage situation. Not on the second one. So I need my else and I need my console input, not right line, not all input. So I'm just going to cheat and copy my else and my console right line, not all input was numeric, sorry, so that I can paste it. Save a wee bit of time. And I'm going to paste that here. So if radius was okay, nice. We do our calculations. But if not, else, console right line, not all input was numeric, sorry. So that is the code for our sphere section. And I should put comments here. A B is a sphere. And I should do the same thing for my first diff. I should scroll up and say, scroll, 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 and A is a block. Now I'm going to scroll back down so that you can take a moment. see this code. I wish I could get it all on one page. I could only do that by removing some white space or zooming out one level. So there we go. That's our second LSIF. Gonna run it. I'm gonna type in bad input to actually make sure that it handles that gracefully. Not all input was numeric, sorry. And then, since we know the input was not good, it's acceptable to be displaying zeros. It'd be neater to set an error flag and then to not display output if we had an error message, but we're not going to do that. So, to give you one last look at the first part of it, it is too much code to fit on one screen, but you can pause it as need be. Here's the choice for block. If choice is equal to lowercase a or uppercase a, do all that stuff. This is all the way down to the depth OK is equal to double dot triparse, and then we have some lines underneath that. If height OK and width OK and depth OK, do our calculations, else print an error message. That was the block code. And if you need the sphere code, there it is with a trailing, you know, brace at the very end of it. So if you didn't want the area volume thing to print if you put in garbage, would you put that in with the if checking if the Boolean statement's correct? Right, we could. We could clean this up a lot to make it be better behaved. What we might want to do is have a flag called valid calculations or something like that. In which case we then might have an if statement like this that said if valid output. Now we don't have that flag so this is not going to work. And we would only set valid output if we actually calculated radius okay. In fact let's do that. Let's do this. So that's my flag, valid output, and I need to set it equal to true if the calculations succeed. So where I say if radius is equal to OK, I'm going to add the line valid output is equal to true. I'm going to have to go and declare that variable up at the top. So I'm starting from the bottom and we're working my way up. I need to add the same line to my other calculation. And we need one more else at the bottom here, so what if they chose something completely wrong? 
they didn't choose A or B. We need to print out a message saying he's no good. So scrolling up, scrolling up, scrolling up to this other place. Whoops, I've scrolled up too far. Here's the other place where we calculated volume and area. Let's also set valid output equal to true there. And so the only time we're going to display output is if those calculations succeed. And yes, we could have cut those print lines, copied them, and pasted them inside the if statements. I was trying to avoid doing that, but it resulted in us having to do a bit more work. I'm not sure it was worth it. Now I actually have to declare that guy. So I'm going to scroll all the way up to our variable declarations and tack on bool valid output. And it's going to be initialized to false. In uh, our program, we're guilty until proven innocent. You know, we don't have good data. We don't have good output unless the calculations work. So what did I just add to all this? Up here at the top where we declare our variables, I tacked on a declaration and in, not instantiation, initialization of the valid output flag. It's called a flag because you know you're flagging it down whether it works or not. That's an informal term. Then down here where we calculate the volume and the area of the block, we set valid output equal to true because otherwise it's a mistake, right? They didn't enter numeric input or they made a choice that wasn't supported. And then lastly, we did the same thing for calculating the volume in the area of the sphere. And I want to tack on one final else statement, which is if they didn't choose A or B, we're just going to need to let them know. Console.WriteLine, no such shape supported. And you're going to put this after all the rest of your if statements. So after you're checking for a cylinder or a tetrahedron, you know, or a cube, that's where you're else. So this is the final else, right? Because you can't then go and go else choice. This is not going to work. Choice is equal to C, you know, something like that. That's not going to work because you've already put your final else there, your terminating else. All your else statements are going to have to go above that. So I'm going to just add a comment here indicating where my other else's are going to go. Else if choice is equal to C, blah, 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 you know, do the rest of this stuff. All right, we've added some error checking. We've added a lot of stuff to it. And where we use that valid output flag was down here to cage off our print results. So we only printed our results if we actually had some good data. Perform a calculation on a block or a sphere. What if I type in something wrong, like a C? No such shape supported. Hit enter to close that. It'd be kind of neat if it looped. But we haven't talked about loops, so I'm not going to add that yet. Perform calculations on a block or a sphere. I'm going to say it's going to be a sphere, but I'm going to type in garbage. You should always try to break your program in as many ways as possible. You're a 1700 levels programming student. You should be able to add error handling to your code and not just make it crash because they typed in something bad, if possible. Okay, not all input was numeric, sorry. I'm going to run it one more time. I'm going to give it some good data. What is the radius? 1. The area is 12 and the volume is 4. I guess that's about right because if it's got a radius of 1, it would have a uh, diameter of 2 and 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, but it wouldn't fill up in 2 by 2 by 2 block. hope that's right. Ought to be. We sure do have a lot of decimal places. It would be nice to you know change our formatting to only display a few decimal places. All right, I'm going to change my rules here, my formulas, just a little bit to make it a little bit clearer. I'm going to leave it R to the 2 like that, but I am going to make 
2 to the power of 0 0.5 the square root of 2 and e to the power of 3 is going to be square root of 3 where e is the edge length. So our homework is add support for three more shapes. The tetrahedron, the cube, and cylinder. And I will prettify the homework assignment. I can remove that comment now about something to the 0 0.5. So as a reminder, use math.py, comma, math.power to do to the power of, and math.sqrt. Just like Java, the math library is brought in by default, so you don't have to add an include for it. Okay, so if we want to prettify our output to only display two decimal places, we're going to try that. We're going to go to the placeholder, and where we have placeholder one, we're going to say colon. Nope, change is not allowed while code is running, sorry. Think. Zero colon, or colon zero dot zero zero. I want to see if that works. Is, I know I've already done this, sorry I don't remember. And that did work, 12.57 units squared, so I rounded it to two. Yeah, I just... So here's what I changed. I made this, the second placeholder in each line after the number of the argument we were printing. I put a colon followed by a format specifier. In this case, 0.00, .00 means do it to two decimal places. If I typed in 0, .000, 000, it would display it to four decimal places. Two is probably enough, right? But All right, I think that about wraps it up.